This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Robin Crane. We're here today with uh, Julian Zavisovsky and Alex Leverington. I'm sure many of you will have heard of these guys before. They are uh, working on on Golem. Golem is one of the was one of the quite earlyish um, Ethereum. Uh, what's called ICO today. You know, they they did a crowd sale raising about uh, nine nine million dollars uh, at some point last year to build a decentralized uh, cloud computing platform. And so we have today here Julian, who's the CEO, and Alex Leverington, who is working on their peer-to-peer networking architecture. And he's also an advisor to the project. I know Alex because we used to both work from the Ethereum hub in Berlin. So I've known him for a while. He was before a developer at Ethereum. And and also Julian I've known because he's he's given a talk before about Golem, before their fundraiser, even at at the meetup in Berlin. And yeah, so super excited to have you guys on. Uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting us. Yeah, I mean, you guys have, have been, I guess, through uh, quite a uh, insane journey to you know because you had this this early fundraiser, which was already uh, so very successful, right? I think you guys raised like uh, nine million dollars in like half an hour, and since then, there's just this whole uh, crowdfunding thing has has gone exponential and exponential but golem is, is fared very well right there's, there's a lot of attention uh, on the project uh, and and price wise it's appreciated a lot as well how much that means about the project i guess is always a question but um so how, how has that journey been for you guys yeah well actually that wasn't that long time ago when we um, had our crowdfunding it was november uh, 2016, but already, already I think like things were starting to to go uh, pretty insane at that time. So our our like officially our our crowdfunding took uh, 29 minutes, but like the last 10 minutes were only because we we were like waiting for a fraction of ether to to close the uh, the the crowdfunding amount, and and also like. Perhaps it would take uh, around two minutes if we uh, had not uh, DDO's uh, my Ether wallet, for which we are like very sorry uh, uh, until today. Uh, by by recommending like everyone to use uh, my Ether wallet during during crowdfunding, that was that was uh, too big uh, success. And 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 of course, like uh, ever, ever since we we feel the responsibility of, of all the people uh, trusting us uh, during this crowdfunding, we are working hard to to deliver. And and of course, this is this is this is uh, this is difficult technology. This is bidding at technology, but I think we are making fair progress. And yeah, and personally, I'm I'm still as excited about that as I was uh, half a year ago or even like a uh, few times more. It's definitely very exciting. Um, it's good to see other projects um, also sort of um, growing in the space as well. So my Ether wallet, you know, <clears throat> they did a great job and they were really responsive. Um, and uh, um, so it, it's that kind of thing where you know rising tides raises raises all ships, um, and uh, it it it's it's also interesting to see people around the world who have um, who said they they bought Golem tokens because they believe in the project. That's also um, a little nervous too. So uh, we 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 have a lot of work to do, and, and security is really important in this space. So it's it's really intense. Yeah, I should also disclaim at this point that I, I also put in a little bit of money into the Golem fundraiser back then, so I, I still hold uh, some Golem tokens. 
So, so, so you actually made it into the crowdfund. <laughs> I, I did actually, I did actually using my ether wallet too, I think. Oh yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. But maybe we can take even a step before that crowdfunding event and maybe Julian can just tell us a bit about how did the original idea of Golem come about and how was that project born? Yeah. Well, although I'm, I'm, I'm not an engineer, I, I always was a kind of techie person. And, and especially uh, uh, the centralized computing, I always found uh, a very appealing idea, like running uh, SETI at home on my, on my desktop back uh, in the late 90s uh, in, in college times. And back then I thought that this is something that kind of makes sense to, to use computers that wouldn't be used uh, otherwise. But then, of course, I, I, I worked for many years on, on different, different things. Then, then a couple of years uh, ago, I, I started working much more with uh, software development. Uh, and then we, we came across Ethereum project very early uh, in Ethereum project, like early uh, 2014. And, and then we, we, we realized at some, at some point that, that you could combine uh, the Ethereum network or like for the security and for consensus, every computer basically does the same with the other network, which we eventually named Golem Network, where every computer does something different. Because like the, the, the critical problem with the truly decentralized computing network is, is, is how to co coordinate all the nodes in, in, a, in a decentralized uh, way. Like by coordination, you can, you can understand a lot of different things like, like payments, like, uh, like security, like uh, uh, how to operate in, in, a, in, in a trustless way. That, that was the beginning when we, when, we, when we thought that using smart contracts on Ethereum, you can actually create a, a truly decentralized network. Decentralized, not only in, in a way that you decentralize computing over nodes, because this is something very basic, like this is, this is, this is successfully done for, for a long time, but, but also like how to introduce uh, uh, economy in, 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 into that system, to, to give people incentives to, to contribute their power to uh, the computing power to, to any project run on the, on, on the network, not necessarily like a cool, cool one, like searching for aliens, like we just said at home. So maybe just uh, at this point, uh, remind our listeners, uh, what is distributed computing? I mean, we, we've had uh, other distributed computing projects on the show before, and we can talk about those and you know, how they're similar or different to Gollum uh, later on the show. But give us just a sort of high-level overview of this type of technology and how it exists today and how it's it's being used and applied in you know different fields, industries, etc. So um, I, I think a sort of quick summary of distributed computing is um, it's <clears throat> I mean it's very much what the term the, the the term says what it is and it is what it says. Simply put, distributed computing is taking some task or set of tasks and um, coordinating the separation, the optimal separation of the tasks into smaller pieces, and then distributing those onto multiple machines. Distributed computing can even be at like a small scale where you have one machine with a lot of CPU cores, um, and it can also go through the network where you have um, where you have a data center full of machines, and um, and you distribute uh, the computational tasks across those machines. And what makes distributed computing a little different um, is that oftentimes the the type of task that needs to be ep executed, the algorithms involved in that task determine um, how it can or can't be distributed. Um, because in some cases, there are tasks that are sequential and they can't be distributed. So um, <clears throat> distributed computing uh, is, is, uh, is, is coordinating all of that. And um, uh, for us, the decentralized distributed computing is where that coordination can take place um, on a peer-to-peer -peer network without, um, without a lot of... Uh, administration or manual coordination from a human operator. 
what you can do with distributed computing is execute highly parallel tasks by leveraging massive amounts uh, or in, in, in volume of uh, computing units uh, and those computing units execute those tasks in parallel uh, and therefore you sort of distribute um, uh, the execution to all these nodes. Um, now, what, what Gollum is, is building is the uh, network that will organize the uh, sort of supply and demand of these computing resources and the tools and the marketplaces in order for users to be able to um, have access to distributed computing networks, if, if I can sum it up that way. How different is that from how things are done now? Like if I want to use a distributed computing network today, because they, you know, they're, they're out there, um, how do I do that? So right now, today, um, most software libraries for distributed computing are either very low level or they, if they're high level, they're very application specific. Um, so one maybe for a certain machine algorithm, <clears throat> machine learning algorithm, another maybe for a certain image processing algorithm. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what we're doing with Gollum is building tools as well as a network topology that is, is generalized um, rather than uh, being very low level and specific to a certain processor um, or being uh, application specific at a high level. So it's, it's almost like a middleware framework for distributed computing uh, to, together with the transactional aspect, of course. And so why, what's Golem adding to this? Is it, is it mainly to make it generalized and, and why is that such an important thing? Yeah, well, maybe I'll start and then, then, then you add what you, uh, what you think I'm, I'm, I'm missing in my answer. So um, I, I think there are at least two like, important things here. Like one, one is the, the economy of the system and second is, is technology. But both boils down into, into the notion that, that we want to like abstract uh, we want to abstract computing and using hardware from using software. So, so like, it, actually, you never need your computer, or you never need your cloud, or your decentralized system. All, all you need is, is is the result produced by your software. So, what you're interested in basically is, is software and the result of the whatever you want your software to do. Uh, like everything else is not really necessary. It, it can be abstracted. So what, what you want to do is, is, is we want to like create market for, for computing power, but also co combined with, with the market for, for software. And, and this way, like abstract both. And like, I, I know that that might sound very abstract, <laughs> uh, put it that way, but, but I think that at the end of the day, this is exactly what we want to do. Now, what, what are the benefits? Like, like if, if you, of course, if you create like well, one, one market, which is, uh, you, you can hope that it will work much better than a lot of small fragmented markets as they are, uh, as, as, as it is at the moment, because, because they basically cloud computing uh, market, which is not at least at the moment, it's not exactly uh, a substitute to Golem, but let's say it is like a close analog to, to Golem. So, so this market works on a, in a little bit wide way because you have like a very few, very large players and, and, and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of, of, of medium and, and small players. Uh, and, and I believe that only like adding a, a market being a kind of middleware, as Alex described, it will make much easier to rent this computing power for anybody around the world. Will be like hard. It will be an important distortion of the of the market. Not not only in terms of price, but also in, in terms of like who get the job. Uh, but but also on uh, I think that that the fact that uh, uh, how we want software to be used on top of Golem gives uh, a very 
interesting new distribution channel for, for its software developers. Uh, and and on, on top of that, of course, you, you, you have all the uh, economies of scale by which we, we hope that the price will be lower uh, than in traditional system, but of course this is this is not like the this is this is one of the promises, but I don't think this is the most important part of it. And then the second, you have you have all the uh, all the uh, advantages and disadvantages of of the centralized system. And and I believe that the, in this particular case, like advantages are, are much more important than disadvantages. So you you described sort of the stack, right? Uh, at the bottom layer, we have the, the the different distributed computing networks, and then Gollum is somewhere in the middle there between those networks uh, and and the applications. Would Gollum then enable sort of new types of apps uh, uh, or new types of business models? You know, maybe describe uh, at the higher level in the stack uh, what types of new applications could emerge you know, if Gollum would be successful. Sure. So uh, I, I would say that, that to start with, we are, we are not addressing uh, new applications. We, we are addressing like a, a, a new uh, ways of using uh, applications that are already here. So, so this, this is also why, why I think this, this is a really valid business model because we just you know, look around, we see a lot of software that, that could benefit from running on software, on, on Golem. And, and, and this, is, this is what we hope to see on Golem in, in, a, in a few years or, or a few quarters, perhaps, in, in, in some use cases. Uh, at, at, the end, at the end of the day, I, I would say that the, 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 the most important difference is uh, in, a, in a business model uh, for uh, for the software developer. So so now usually in a, in a, in a in a task we we are in a, in a software we are we are aiming to is is it works like that that you that you get the software and then you deploy it some somewhere or you've got hardware you deploy software on your, on your hardware and then you are seeking for users. To use the software that runs on your hardware, and what we want to do is that user gets software and then like rents using the software along with renting the hardware that the software is running on. And and I think this is this is a, a, a really uh, a game changer here. Also, if you think about about uh, about open source software and 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 community driven integrations or. You by, 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 by deploying them on Golem, you 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 solve both um, uh, the problem you you want to uh, to solve with the software itself, but also like the usability problem, like the problem of how to deploy that on on a large network. Perhaps Alex would like to comment on that as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that um, there there may be some new apps, but I. I think we're going to see new apps because we're seeing more peer-to-peer -peer networks. I, I, I can't necessarily say that those new apps are going to be something that is made possible because of Gollum, um, uh, but more because people learn how to leverage the peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, and but I do think, like to what Julian's saying, that. Um, we will see applications function differently. Um, so some of the stuff is going to be under the hood. And I, I think that's the same case with, with like Ethereum, that um, we, we may see some interesting new apps, but they're going to be like sort of recreations of what we already have, um, you know, only powered by Gollum or powered by uh, Ethereum. And the, the economics, you know, for example, crowd funds, um, that's something Ethereum enabled. And so we're not sure, you know, exactly what Gollum will enable, but, um, we think it's going to have to do with the software developers and the providers providing their resources to the internet. So it seems that at, at this time there, there's sort of a lot of projects in the space that are doing things that are quite similar or somewhat similar to, to Gollum. So our, our listeners will be familiar with episodes we did with uh, with iExec, with Truebit, and then perhaps a little bit more 
um, further away from Gollum, but to some extent still with the same, looking to do the same thing. Uh, projects like uh, Microsoft Bletchley and they're, what they're doing there with Cripplets and uh, Town Crier. Um, maybe more focused on the distributing on the distributed computing projects like like iExec and Truebit. Uh, can can you perhaps talk about how Gollum is similar or different to to those two projects? So iExec and Truebit, uh, I guess those are, I think those are two very different projects. Um, <clears throat> from from our understanding of iExec, um, it's it's sort of a gateway to um, to leveraging compute resources. Um, I, I think um, their software will evolve. So um, as as will Gollum. So it's it's really hard to say where these two will stand um, long term. Um, but right now, um, Gollum is focused on uh, integration with Ethereum um, together with this sort of uh, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. So um, any peers can join or leave the compute network. Um, wh whereas with iExec, there's sort of a kind of a guardian system there. What, what we're doing is we are building up this peer-to-peer um, this -peer network that's stable given any peers coming and joining. Um, and then we can layer uh, more application-specific networks on top of that. Um, there's been some mention of um, iExec being used for dApps and Gollum not, um, but I think uh, Gollum will be used for dApps as well. Um, somebody will come up with some silly little thing where uh, it launches a service on a Gollum node that then kicks off a smart contract that then launches another service or some silly thing like that. So um, really, I, I think it's going to be up to the, the developers and how they leverage our transaction framework. And uh, with Truebit, so um, Truebit is a really solid piece of technology, I think. Um, however, um, Truebit... I think is more aligned with something like the Ethereum VM uh, or some kind of um, concise environment like an EVM or proof of work where um, you expect every machine to do the same piece of work um, for, for validation. And um, uh, Gollum, I think, will be similar. And at some point, it might even make sense to implement Truebit um, but we're focused on building a sort of framework and layer for applications to interconnect and perform distributed computations. Whereas I suppose Truebit is focused on a validation algorithm and uh, iExec is focused on um, uh, a sort of a gateway for leveraging compute resources. Okay, yeah, so... If on, on the on the Truebit side, we're talking more about validating complex computations outside of Ethereum, uh, but not necessarily computations that are meant to be highly parallel. Whereas uh, on the Gollum and perhaps iExec side, uh, mostly those projects are geared towards providing the tools and the, the, creating the marketplace for distributed computing resources. Yeah, somewhat, and and I think um, Truebit is really good for um, like one EVM, so one piece of software, and all the nodes run the same software. Whereas what we're doing with Gollum is that um, every node is going to run and execute the software that it chooses, um, and the and the requesters are going to choose which software they're executing. So. Truebit, we sort of might fit inside that, um, but we're building the whole um, the whole stack. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just giving some help, help to how we see the whole system working. Like the, the verification is is often has to be like integration specific, and, and for some use cases, for some integrations, like Truebit might be great to do the verification. For others, it will not work. So I, I would I would rather say that that, that Truebit is in fact uh, poten potentially really like 
synergistic, <laughs> we call them. Not, yeah. not competitive at all. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll pass it over to Ledger CTO, Nicolas Baca, who can tell you all about Ledger's security features and SDK. The Ledger Nano S is a personal security device based on a secure element, a screen and button, so that you can verify everything that is done on the device and make sure that you are really doing what you want it to do. Compared to our previous solution, this device is based on the latest generation secure element, the ST31 from ST Micro. The ST31 is, an, is using a secure ARM core, which means that you can have the same ease of development that you would have on a generic uh, microcontroller, but benefit from the security features of a secure element. Security features uh, include an application firewall at the lowest level that lets you protect applications from each other, which means that you can load multiple applications on the hardware wallet, even post-issuance. And you as a developer will be able to leverage these features to load your own application without our authorization and without any kind of authorization from the vendor. We will be providing this device with an open SDK um, that lets you do anything you want with this device. We provide sample applications for cryptocurrencies, different cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, and we will also provide a FIDO authenticator and you will be free to add everything you like. For example, you could add some secure messaging, some encrypted chat, and you'll see that the solution is quite powerful and very easy to develop with. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code Epicenter to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter. Let's dive a little bit deeper into how Golem works technically. So first of all, Golem is a network. There's different parties that do different things in the Golem network. Can you just run us through, you know, who are the different actors and what are their roles? The different actors are we have the providers who have the compute resources. Um, we have the uh, requester, which is kind of like the end user. That's like, you know, the guy ordering a taxi um, and the providers, the driver. And then we, we, have the, we have the application, we have the software developer. And the software developer, you know, implements software that's gonna be run by the providers and, um, and the requester is going to utilize that software as a part of dispatching the request to the, to the, to the network. Maybe we can run through a concrete example, uh, rendering images or 3D um, computations are often mentioned as a use case for Golem. So let's say I'm an architect, you know, I'm, I'm designing some building, have this really heavy computational task. I want to send this to the Golem network for uh for to be rendered and executed so what what steps would i go through on my end and then what would happen on the side of the network you know to deliver that service to me at, at, at the moment perhaps frederick is, is, is the, the best example because that's the one which is working at the moment so maybe 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 the best would be just describe how how golem works right now so how the how the alpha version works right now from the uh, user perspective. So, so, so basically, of course, you, you prepare your work in, in, your, in, your, um, in your software you use to do the work. And then you, you, in case of Blender, you, 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 you write it to the, to the Blender file, perhaps with some uh, more files used as resources to, to do the job. And, and then once you've got that already, then you, start using Golem. So you, you create a task, you, you add this file with any, any, any additional resources that are to be used. Uh, you can, of course, like, change some parameters, like if this is like an animation, how many frames, which frames do you want to render, what is the resolution, those, those kinds of things. Um, you, can, you can also like, uh, decide on, on, the, on the price. This is like a, a little bit tricky, but boils down at the end uh, on on setting like the price for for a for a for a benchmark uh, uh, hour of computing. So this this is what you set. This is not exactly how it works, but 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 at the end of the day, this is as it would work that way. And and then you just send it 
to the nodes that that technically to the nodes that that uh, uh, accept your your work. Maybe 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 Alex will want to elaborate more more on on, on the on the protocol. But uh, what happens then, of course, is the the computing of uh, of the chunks of this uh, of this part on different computers. Oh, and by the way, at the moment, like you decide how this is how this is distributed. So uh, that might be very straightforward. If you, if you have like one hundred frames, you may want like every frame to be computed by a different different node. If you have uh, you you can also like render one frame, splitting that into 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 six, twelve, ten, twenty, whatever tiles, uh, and then and then and then you you gather back the results and and you have your work done. Uh, underneath of course, of course, once this is completed, uh, Ethereum transaction happens with the transfer of um, of of TNT from you to the other nodes. Uh, this is still works in a in, in a rather basic way. One of the or in the efforts we are in at the moment is how to make that very much complicated in a in a different ways depending on the on the on the use case. So I, I think this is like the very high level, Alex. Yes, that that's high level and a little low level too. Um, so yeah, right. I think right now the current, I mean the current interface we have under development. Is that you drag and drop the render file, the the Blender file, into Gollum, and then say, "Oh, this is a uh, this is a Blender file that I want to render," um, and then set the parameters like Julian said, uh, price and everything, and uh, and then hit hit go. I don't know if the button says go, but maybe. Yeah, well, at, at the moment, at the <laughs> moment, do, PR that, for that. do drag and drop, not 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 in a uh, not in a. Uh, not in the release, like like uh, drag and drop is still on the on the on the development project. Yeah, yeah, like I said, it's on the development. <laughs> but, but but ultimately, this is like a drag and drop and drop. Drag yeah, and drop. yeah. And um and so it's I think it's important to note though that um, other software applications in the future using Gollum, they may integrate Gollum directly into their software. So you would just inside the software you'd click uh, render. And then have a little checkbox that says render with Gollum, and then hit OK, and then you'll get the Gollum parameters, and then finish, and then the you know the sort of application will drive the process instead of external software. Um, but right now, uh, it's 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 much easier and more effective for us to develop the software as a separate application. And and I guess that's also one of the because one of the big obstacles with this right is going to be a whole like cryptocurrency buying GNT first like all of that is like uh, not something that's going to be I think achievable for mainstream users anytime soon. But then if you have Golem integrated into the website, right, presumably you can pay uh, with your credit card to the application developer, and then behind the scenes. Uh, you know, he kind of loads a GNT in the application and pays based on behalf of the user. Did you guys see it playing kind of like that? Not exactly, I think. That, that, that depends on developer, I, I believe. But um, I, I, I rather think what Alex described is, is like uh, Golem running somewhere in a system tray as a kind of daemon that you click on that do your services for you, like provides uh, Golem services to your applications. And and then this is not really visible to the user if he uses any kind of render software, any other software that uses Golem. What exactly happens with Golem? But then as for the as for the tokens part, and if this is like uh, dealt by the, uh, with the software developer or the user, uh, our thinking is that both should be possible, but basically uh, uh, we, we should not delegate hard thing to the software developer, but we just should make the hard thing easy. And, and, then, and, then, and then at some point, this is what I described before, that uh, just user uh, pays for using the software over the centralized, the centralized network and the network itself using this golem that works seamlessly. Uh, somewhere in a, in a system, and I, I I'm not very much worried about uh, how uh, people will get tokens. I, I think that we will witness like a massive progress with usability of DApps tokens 
over the next uh, couple of quarters or maybe even over the next couple of months. Uh, basically, this is this is what this industry needs to take off. One of the one of the things this industry needs to take off. This is not a golem specific problem, and and a lot of people are working on on making that simpler. And this is going to happen. Like because there are so many options, um, we're also going to try and build in that usability to where there's something consistent. So a sort of like. Facebook Connect or PayPal, but more for like these native applications that need to interface with a with with tokens. Um, but we we do you know we do have to sort of progress along with the industry and help where we can, uh, making it as easy to use as possible. Now, one important question I want to dive into, and I remember when you gave the talk in Berlin, Julian, that was also one of the questions that a lot of people asked, is the question about, you know, verifying work. Because there's something actually interesting in which a golem is, is similar to a proof of work in Bitcoin, right? So in Bitcoin, right, you, you in a way, you share also this computational problem with all the different miners to all do their work. And the unique feature in Bitcoin, of course, is because of the hashes, you can verify the work very, very cheaply and very efficiently. And you don't actually have to kind of rerun the work to make sure they did it correctly. But now if you talk about, you know, rendering these 100 frames, we, we sent out to different people. Like, how do I actually make sure that what is sent back is, you know, the work done properly as opposed to, you know, maybe half-assed or not at all. Uh, or, you know, in, in some way that's, that's not, you know, according to specification, like how can you ensure that in Golem? So there are several versions of Golem. And um, uh, in the first version, we will be working on tasks like rendering, where we can linearly split up the task um, and, and sort of uniformly um, split the workload of the tasks uniformly across the peers. Um, and when we do that, uh, there's a couple of ways that we can get uh, va validated work. Um, and, uh, and one of them is to add redundancy to where some peers execute random pieces an additional time, and they, they don't know that that's what they're doing. So, you know, basically you have, you know, peers zero through nine, and uh, and peers one and five work on the same piece of work, and they don't know that they're working on the same piece of work. Um, and then if you know if if they don't match, then there's this sort of implicit arbitration. So it's sort of like a preemptive true bit together with kind of a staking system. Now what we have right now is um, we have a reputation system together with this uh, redundancy. Slowly, we will progress towards a str a stronger validation algorithms, um, which basically have um, punishing mechanisms similar to what uh, Vitalik's described with his uh, slasher protocol. It's also important to point out that we will need to have different validation algorithms over time because other com computational tasks like machine learning, it, it may be possible to get the results in the deterministic way, but the funny thing is, is like with machine learning, you you actually sort of have to do another test in order to test the quality of the results. And and with machine learning, the the the, the quality may be easy to cheat. Th these validation problems depend on the use case and the application. Proof of work is something where everybody sees the same data, and so and and it's also self validating. You just check the hash. And everybody in the world doesn't need some custom software to, to verify the proof of work output. With Ethereum, it's the same exact thing. Another important thing about Ethereum is that Ethereum operates on shared data. And so when some Ethereum transaction goes through, every node in the world needs to see the result. With Gollum, however, what we're doing is we have one requester and he sends out this work to you know, 32, 64, or 128 peers. And only the requester needs, the out, needs to see the output at the end of the day. And so because our situation is a little different, we don't have this uh, shared data, like shared state, like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, we, can, we can build on 
different kinds of validation uh, algorithms. We can do some of the things like with hashes and such, but um, it, like I said, it, it's a little different environment. So um, we can do validation through redundancy, not because there isn't shared state, um, but because the output only is needed by the requester. Yeah, I, I would add to that that also one one of the things we are seriously considering that not not working on yet, but but considering is is introducing some kind of uh, voluntary identification, so like that you can voluntarily identify yourself uh, in a way, commit to the some rule of conduct, and then uh, users might opt out to use only a tier of of providers, for example, with this with this kind of, of uh, self-imposed identification, which in fact would create a, a situation a little bit similar to the to the public cloud, where you don't have any any other uh, way of uh, being sure that this is okay apart from trusting the cloud provider because he is a private cloud provider, you know. Yeah, it's, and I, th I think another thing to point out that's interesting about this validation algorithms and Gollum, and maybe there's a question uh, later on this that I'm sort of preempting, um, but there's the, the question of privacy, right? So with Gollum, you're going you're gonna to send out your request to some random providers, and maybe they're going to look, they're going to they're gonna decrypt your input and then take your work and then go and render it themselves and do something with it. Hopefully we, we can make that difficult enough that you know they don't do that. But the thing is, is it's a public decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, it'll be more secure than BitTorrent. You know, we'll, we'll have encrypted traffic so your internet service provider can't see what's going on. Um, but ultimately the providers can actually see the work. So to Julian's point about having named provider sets uh, where there's some uh, trust mechanism with that individual provider, um, this allows for situations where um, Gollum can route work to providers that need to be pre-selected ahead of time. And I know that's not important to the validation algorithm, but um, what's important is that we, we have to consider with the validation algorithm, we also have to consider privacy um, because there are software situations, uh, medical records, and things like that where they just can't run the tasks on a, um, you know, on, a, on on public nodes. So you you guys did a, a your crowd sale on uh, on Ethereum, and so I was wondering um, why is it that you need the Ethereum network? Uh, for to run Gollum, are, are you tied to the Ethereum network? Is, is, could you potentially also use, of use some other uh, payment mechanism, uh, you know, perhaps such as Bitcoin, or uh, is, is it possible in the future that um, you would use some other smart contract um, enabled blockchain to to run the Gollum network? So there's a couple of answers to that question, um, but up front because of the transaction framework and application registry that we have, um, we need a sort of global, you know, global state system with consensus um, for the transactions. Um, and, uh, and, and we're building on the EVM and we're building with Solidity. Um, Ethereum is, uh, it's viable, it's in production. There's a team supporting its development. Um, and I mean, it's been running for a couple of years. So, yeah, maybe we could look at other chains or something, but it would just it would be a huge distraction, and and um, and we don't see how it would add any value to the project. As far as why something like Ethereum, the the answer to that is with Ethereum, the the accounts can sort of talk to each other. Um, so with our transaction framework, um, in the in the later releases, we we won't have this in Brass, but um, when, when a transaction completes, some other event can happen on the chain. And, uh, and that's really important for uh, providers and software developers, like for billing systems and, 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 and things like that. And it's an, also important for a transaction framework 
so that software developers can make it where when their software is run on the Golem network, maybe they get some percentage of the of the GNT as a as a part of their software being run, um, or maybe they need to um, you know have a set of authorized peers or something like that. And the only way to do that in a decentralized way is to have something like Ethereum, where where we can have certain pieces of logic executed flawlessly um, in a in a in a global state. I'll just point out real quick with Bitcoin, they have this the script hashes, but one script hash can't trigger another script hash, and this is this is like. The only way that they could possibly add that is they have to then add this sort of gas cost like mechanism that Ethereum has. Um, and so at, 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 a, at a technical basis, um, it's easier to just build on Ethereum because if we want to build on a chain that doesn't have the EVM like Ethereum does and the gas mechanism, then we would essentially have to rebuild the same thing as Ethereum. And we like Gollum is complex enough as it is, so we don't want to rebuild a blockchain. Yeah, and why rebuild a blockchain when you've got one that works? <laughs> like you said, I mean, it's in production. There's applications running on it. There's a roadmap. There's a team there. I mean, it totally makes sense to be building it on on Ethereum. Um, so let, let's talk about economics a little bit. Uh, so there, as, as we mentioned, there's a, a, a Gollum network token, GNT, that is the, the unit of account, the, the unit of value um, with which you pay for uh, computing resources. And so... Uh, in 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 this, and I believe that will there's a decentralized marketplace as well. Uh, essentially, yeah. Okay, so in in this marketplace, um, you you have uh, uh, buyers that are looking to buy uh, distributed computing resources, and, and sellers that are selling um, access to the resources, their un, the unused resources on their computer to uh, to to those buyers. Um, what are the types of aside from sort of you know, supply and demand that may affect the price of a computing resource. What are the other parameters that might affect price? You know, I'm thinking of things like you know, geography, latency, the the power of the computing resources, uh, maybe like the rate of um, the rate of success uh, of you know the the resource in question. Uh, so, what what goes into basically like if if I'm providing a com- computing resources to the network? Uh, how 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 do I compare to to others, for instance, on, on what parameters? Yeah, I, I think we will know it once we once we are in production, because only then we will see like what computers do we really have in, in the network. Like we, we we can have some idea of, of like what is in, in in small or medium data centers we we accept to to, to join, but apart from that, like. We don't we don't really know like what what hardware like specifically will join the network and, that, and of course the other level of complexity is added by um, GPU computing which is uh, a little bit more tricky than CPU computing but which we are going to to support for sure and, and we're working on it I, I I believe like having said that I I believe that market like Golem. Uh, should eventually uh, convert with the price to the, to the marginal cost of, of computing. So this like a, a little bit like like perfect competition situation. Of course, like this is this will not be like a single price because uh, although I think like the hardware price is 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 quite similar uh, around the globe. Then electricity price for sure is not identical. Latency, of course, is not identical, and and, and latency might be uh, an issue. Uh, not, I don't think this this will be like much of an issue in a in a very early uh, integrations like with high throughput computing. But well, yeah, that, that even even that that might be an issue, and and later on definitely latency will be an issue. So where you're geographically. Will will be important not only because cost of electricity but also because of latency, and then of course on, on top of it, um, uh, we we believe that 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 running your uh, uh, hardware with 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 Golem will be much more efficient, like uh, uh, in in an upkeep effort needed. 
than than any, anything else. Also, like with marketing effort needed. Uh, but but of course, like the the, the cost of labor will also uh, play a role. So that that was kind of uh, uh, a long way of 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 telling you uh, we don't really know we don't know yet. But 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 the price should be should be should be quite low because uh, because we we want to create like highly competitive market. Okay, and so on your website, there's a video where you sort of explain the high level vision of Gollum, and one of the things you mention uh, is this idea that you, you want to create a network where anybody can participate, and there's sort of this underlying feeling that okay, right now, like we send our distributed computing, you know, um, uh, executions to s software companies like Amazon and Google, and it would be ideal if that could be a bit more distributed and not so centralized there. Um, however, uh, it seems that if Gollum is to be successful, uh, that companies like Google, like Amazon, and others with massive amounts of computing resources might also want to participate in these networks to to make money, right? And with just the what would happen if they were just to come in and flood the market and bring the price down? How would I be competitive to you know with them? Is that something that's desirable? Are there mechanisms in place to prevent this sort of thing yeah if if, if uh, aws or, or or google join golem that that would be great and they, they should i believe uh and, and in fact like the very early in the project like like uh two years ago and more uh we we, we thought about golem mostly as uh of a sharing computing network so so we so we we thought about Golem as as as, as running predominantly on on uh, home computers on on people's desktops and laptops maybe sometimes a little bit more sophisticated like gaming uh, computers or, or rendering machines in in someone's cellars but 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 still that the uh, the assumption was that this is basically directed directed to individuals in a in a, in a computer sharing mechanism. And although, like, uh, we still still believe in this idea, and this is this is something that keeps motivating us, and we want to create technology that 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 will make it possible. I I, I think that we realized that actually this technology is of uh, much interest of of small and medium data centers, also, and and not only not only miners afraid of proof of stake <laughs> in Ethereum, but but also like just regular data centers. And if you if you think about it, it makes sense not only because they have unused capacity, which is somehow obvious that they have, but also because like true edge in 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 running data center now, as far as I understand that, a uh, small or, or medium data center is, it's not because you have like some hardware but because you have some hardware and you know how to put it into into use, so you, you you have already some software, your software or your client software that needs a lot of uh, a lot of computing, and, and in fact your edge is with this uh, software and not necessarily with the hardware which you need for this software. So so perhaps we can give them even greater edge, but just giving them more hardware. Yeah, I I, th I think there's also. One one possibility, which is which is definitely, you know, on the roadmap, is that um, if Gollum is easier to use than those other systems, um, pricing is important. But um, those systems are also still kind of hard to use, and the billing systems are not fun. Um, it's it's also important to remember that the larger players have tiered pricing. So while while the majority of their clients may pay one price. Some of their clients who uh, are compute uh, who have high computing needs, for example, with Amazon, reserve the instances even when they're not using them because the price is lower. And there's this now they've basically reserved something that they may not use, but it's still an advantage because it's cheaper than if they use it on demand. Um, and uh, the similar thing happens with the larger data centers and probably with Google too. Um, my point here is that um, there is some median market price and uh, the larger players have discounted services for
for larger clients. Those larger clients who are have committed to that, um, if they are paying less than the market price for on-demand computing, then they may actually run Gollum on their nodes, even though they're on AWS or SoftLayer or Google or whatever. Um, and those data center companies can't tell them you can't run Gollum. You know they can't go and block Gollum on their firewall. Um, so the thing is, is um, in those environments. Gollum is unstoppable once it gets launched. Um, and there's an incentive to actually run Gollum. Um, so the, the, the real question is, is you know, um, are people going to want to run it? Is there enough incentive? incentive? And, and I think we've talked to a lot of providers, and they want to see our software running. Um, universities want to use it so that the universities can you know, lease out their idle compute hardware. Um, and um, it it'll be really interesting to see how how large the uh, um, non AWS, non Google, non Azure market is. It'll also be interested interesting for us to see how many people run Gollum on those environments when they have discounted pricing. So, can you guys tell us a bit about the the current status of the project? Uh, I know you had a, a release schedule, and I think. Uh, brass release is supposed to be coming up soon. What can we expect then, and and when when is the time when it will come out? It's coming soon, but we are not giving any any dates any any longer. Like we 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 really believed in, back in November two thousand sixteen that six months is is doable, uh, but obviously it, it, it was not. So so we we are really advanced and and we did really a lot over the last six months but but still we don't feel that this is um, ready for release yet uh, what we are aiming for at the moment is is, is having uh, beta what what we have now, the, those are just names but what what we have at the moment we call alpha because still it's not stable enough and uh, UX is not good enough to, for that to be to be like usable in in like anything close to real use. Uh, this is still like like for testing mostly. But but we we hope that we will be able to to put together really really soon the version that we intend to name beta. So this will be brass golden beta version, and and actually this 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 software should be. Of, of much use for, for our first potential user group. And, 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 and actually, the, the plan is now to, to, to start with the um, uh, onboarding of, of the first uh, early adopters with this, with, with this beta version. So make that in, not really in a, in a, in a production, but in a, in a production-like environment to have like real users over a real network, which we will probably subsidize a little bit just to make sure that the user experience for early users is, is, is great. And, and this, this is basically how we want to, to create some scale to, uh, to finish all the testing and all the work that, that we need to secure the network with before the, the, the release. And by release here, I, I mean switching to the uh, Ethereum mainnet and, and GNT for transactions. So what's coming soon is, I hope, this, this better release. Uh, sometime after that, uh, production release, like Brass Golem 1.0. Uh, oh. Yeah, but of course, like the, the only true answer is like this is ready when it is ready and yeah and as, as for the progress uh, uh, we, we made over the last six six months if you we, we, we can tell you more about that but this is like a little bit technical so yeah may, maybe we are running quite late but maybe Alex you can just give us a, a three a three minutes like what you know highlight things of, uh, of the technical progress you guys have made just at a real high level um, uh, somewhat technical. Um, we replaced, we're in the process of replacing a QT interface, um, QT based, uh, which is like sort of, um, you know, na na native user interface uh, from Python code uh, with Electron. Um, and Electron is like this sort of web based user interface for desktop apps 
Um, GitHub uses it now and a couple of other large projects that MIST is built with that. Um, but uh, it's a little easier to do um, development changes and design changes. We have also spent quite a bit of time on the storage layer. Um, a lot of storage projects that we're looking at are content delivery systems, and we really need something for like these sort of on-demand compute swarms. We're evaluating those different storage subsystems and understanding like how they're going to fit into Gollum in the future and uh, sort of curating it to something that's going to work effectively for Brass. Um, also working on specifications so that we can uh, have effective uh, security audits. We'll also, we've drafted some ideas for smart contracts um, for the providers. Um, the, I mean, GNT is really this sort of token for machine-to-machine -machine transactions. You have somebody's computer, you know, who knows, could be in Montana, and you have these other computers all over the world. Um, the, 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 the providers maybe in a data center and they don't want to put their private keys on their provider machine. So we're looking at um, how to do the payment system in a way that providers can, can also sort of have remote, um, remote management of the, uh, 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 of the, of the tokens. And the, and the other thing is um, we're integrating the dev P2P library, which is the one used by Ethereum for the underlying peer-to-peer -peer network um, that Gollum's going to use in Brass. Um, and uh, this is so that we could scale up um, discovery a, a, a little easier. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's going well. Um, we were supposed to do some of that a couple of releases later, um, but found that it's a little more... Uh, time effective to, to do that uh, now rather than later which is cool because hopefully it'll mean well I, I don't want to talk anything about timelines but um, the releases that come shortly after Brass hopefully maybe they'll have more functionality than, than what we had in the roadmap but no, no promises until we get it done cool I'm sure people will be excited to hear that uh, thanks so much for the update. Now I have one last question before we wrap up. So, uh, Julian, can you can you share like to what extent has a, a Golem community formed with people who aren't just you know interested in the price or own some tokens, but you know actually are interested in in building projects uh, on Golem? Uh, do you have some some exciting things happening in that area? Yeah, definitely. So of course, like. The community is, is of course like mostly uh, crypto community at the moment. So people who just uh, are very very fascinated about about the technology, but but coming from from crypto world, also some some token holders. And this is great community, but but not necessarily like uh, uh, they have uh, they 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 will be using Golden for for doing any computing. But we see more and more projects coming, and some of them really, really great, uh, that are interested in, in, in building on Golem. And, and we, we see that both from uh, rendering industry, so like the, the first niche we, uh, we want to work with, but also from, from data centers uh, industry, um, uh, from, from all things that have some like something like high throughput computing so we we had already some uh, very early talks with, with with companies processing large amounts of financial data large amounts of, of, of satellite data so I, I would say that 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 there is more and more interest of, of how golem can be used I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that that if only we are able to deliver technology that, that others can use, they will use it. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on, guys. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and, and learning a bit more about what's going on with Golem at the moment. Thank you very much. That was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, thank you as well. 
And thanks so much for our listener for once again tuning in. Uh, we are going to be back next week with another episode. And of course, this part, this show is part of Let's Talk Bitcoin. So you can find this show and all the shows on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. And if you want to support the show, what you can do that does us a huge favor is leaving an iTunes review and uh, so new people can find the show. Thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.